Right, this is AP Chemistry Podcast 4.5. We're going to talk about drawing molecules, um, formal charge, so how do you know what these molecules should look like, and then molecular geometries and the polarity of them. So the first thing you need to remember is Lewis structures, and a Lewis structure is just something that shows you how the valence electrons are arranged in a, mole in a molecule or polyatomic ion. So when we're drawing Lewis structures, we're drawing how they are sharing electrons. So these are four covalent compounds. And covalent compounds are also called molecules. And this also works with polyatomic ions. So things like um, ammonium or carbonate. Those are your polyatomic ions that we can also draw Lewis structures for. When you're doing these Lewis structures, you need to remember the octet rule, and the octet rule is just kind of what it sounds like, that these things bond to get eight electrons, because when they have eight electrons, they have a full outer shell, and that makes them stable. So when we're looking at drawing these structures, we need to make sure that each atom has eight electrons around it. Of course, there are exceptions to that rule, um, hydrogen being the most obvious one. Hydrogen is happy with just two electrons because it wants to be like helium. But there's a few other exceptions that we'll talk about along the way, but that's really the big one for now. Okay, rules for drawing Lewis structures. The first thing you're gonna do is go to the periodic table, and you're gonna add up the total number of valence electrons, and we need to include ion charges. So when you're looking for the total number of valence electrons, you're looking at the column heading. So for example, oxygen is in column 6A, so it has six valence electrons. Um, hydrogen is in 1A, so it has one valence electron. Nitrogen is in 5A, so it has five valence. Whatever that column heading is, that's how many valence electrons it has. With the ionic charges right here, if it has a charge of plus one, that means you're going to lose an electron. If it has a charge of say negative two, that actually means that you gained electrons. So you need to lose or subtract electrons from your total if you have a positive charge, and you need to add to your total when you have a negative charge. So once you've figured out how many valence electrons you have, you're going to start by placing a single bond between the central atom and all the terminal atoms. The terminal atoms just being the atoms that are on the outside of the central atom. Then you're gonna make sure everybody has eight electrons around them, and we do that by giving lone electron pairs. And I'll show you some examples with these. And then you're gonna create double, triple bonds as needed. So if you have too many, this is for too many. Too many electrons, so in your picture, if you have more than what you said you could from step one, you'll create double and triple bonds. If you need more electrons because you weren't able to fit as many as you needed, then you always give those extra electrons to the central atom. So let's do some examples with this. We have sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide would be SO2. Sulfur and oxygen are both in column 6A. So I'm going to get six valence electrons from the sulfur, and I'm going to get six from each of the oxygens. So 12 plus another six is 18. I am going to put, and it usually works this way, the one that comes first in the center. So sulfur is going to go in the center, and I'm going to start by single bonding the two O's. And then I need to give everybody eight. So it looks like this. So there everybody has eight. So this will be two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. A line is two electrons being shared. A double bond is four electrons being shared. And a triple bond is six electrons being shared. So right now, that two, there's two electrons right here that are being shared between the oxygen and the sulfur. So everybody has eight. And when I counted that up, I got too many. I got to 20. So what I have to do is I create a double bond. And I can do it on either side of the sulfur. It doesn't matter. I'll pick this side. So I would create a double bond here. And when I do that, I have to get rid of a lone pair from the two atoms that I just connected. Because now instead of them having their own, they're going to share in the middle. 
So now I have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. And that's what I said I could have. So if I redraw this, oops, I put the double bond on the other side. Oh well. It would look like this without the scribbled out marks. It would look like that. So that would be your answer for sulfur dioxide. That would be the Lewis structure for it. The next one is carbon dioxide. So carbon is in column 4A, so it has four valence electrons. Each oxygen has six, so 12 plus 4 is 16. I'm going to put carbon in the middle, and I'm going to single bond my O's, and I'm going to start by making sure everyone has eight. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. There we go. So 20 electrons is too many. So I'm going to create a double bond. And when I do that, I get rid of that lone pair and this lone pair. So now I have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, which is still too many. And molecules like to be symmetrical if they can. So instead of doing a triple bond, I'm going to make a double bond on the other side. So when I do that, that will go away and this will go away. So I'm left with 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 electrons. So this will be O, double bond C, double bond O, and those O's will each have two lone electron pairs left on them. So that would be your final answer right there for carbon dioxide. The next one is the nitrate ion. And the nitrate ion I need to watch out because it's an ion, it has a charge. So it's NO3 with a negative one charge. That means I'm going to add nitrogen, which has five valence electrons. Each oxygen has six. And because this is a negative one charge, it means it's picked up an extra electron. So I add one to the total. So this would be 18, 19, plus that is 24 electrons. So my structure can only have 24 electrons in it. I put the N in the middle, and I'm going to attach my three O's. Start by giving everyone eight. And then my oxygen right now only has two, four, six electrons around it, so it needs that lone pair on the top. When I add these up, I get to 26, which is too many, so I need to create a double bond. And I'll just do it off of that oxygen and nitrogen right there, so I'm going to get rid of a lone pair on each. So if I redraw this, and I'm not going to redraw all my O's, but this is the structure of what it would look like. And because it's an ion, you need to make sure you use square brackets and you put the charge on the outside. So I guess I should probably put those in. So this is what your nitrate ion would look like. And that would be your final answer for that one. Okay, ammonium and the ion. Ammonium is NH4, and it has a plus one charge. So nitrogen, nitrogen again has five, four hydrogens that each have one, and because this is a plus one, I'm going to subtract one from my total. So this is five plus four is nine, minus one is eight. So nitrogen in the middle, hydrogens all around, and I need to be careful with this because hydrogens do not get lone pairs. They're happy with just two electrons, which means a single bond. So I'm going to start with this, and I have two, four, six, eight electrons around it. That's what I said I could have, so this is the structure. I don't have to do anything else. I need to square bracket it, though, because it is an ion. So there's your answer for the ammonium ion. Okay. So I said earlier that there are exceptions to the octet rule. Um, what happens when you have more or less electrons than eight? They're not obeying what you think they should. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine should always have eight electrons. These are four that should never, ever violate the octet rule. They should always have eight. Boron and beryllium often have fewer. They call those two atoms electron deficient. 
So they're happy with less than eight. They don't need eight electrons. So how you remember that is with boron and beryllium, you never give them lone electron pairs. You're just going to bond them to whatever they need to be bonded to according to the formula, and then you're not going to put any dots around boron or beryllium. And then you also need to understand that third row elements that have d orbitals can go above eight electrons. So for example, a lot of times when you see phosphorus, you're going to see it with 10 electrons around it. And this is where when we can exceed eight electrons, if you're looking to add more to your structure, you always put it around the central atom. You always put lone pairs around your central atom. So we're going to do some examples with those. If I have phosphorus pentachloride, phosphorus is P, pentachloride would be Cl5. So phosphorus has five valence electrons, it's in the 5A column, plus five times seven for each chlorine, so that'd be 35 plus five is 40. So right away, this should look weird because I'm gonna have to attach five chlorines around the phosphorus. So phosphorus, right from the start is going to have more than eight electrons around it. And it does not matter how you arrange these right now. You're just going to try and fit all those chlorines in, however you can get them in there. So I'm going to start then by making sure chlorines have eight. I'm not going to do anything to my phosphorus. I'm going to leave it alone for now because it's already going above eight electrons. And if I add all these up, each of these arms has eight. So one, two, three, four, five. Five times eight is 40. This is the structure I would have for phosphorus pentachloride. It's an exception to the rule because phosphorus right now has 10 electrons around it. Okay, the next one is chlorine trifluoride. So chlorine would be Cl. Trifluoride is F3. Chlorine and fluorine all have seven valence electrons. So seven times the four atoms would be 28. I'm going to start with chlorine in the center because it's the single. And I'm going to put three fluorines off of it. So when I start like that, I can treat it as a normal problem because it's kind of looking like it might be normal. I give fluorine eight. And I'm going to give chlorine 8. So when I do this, I get 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. 26 is too few. I need 28. And when we need more electrons, we always add them to the central atom. So since I need another lone pair because I need to go from 26 to 28, I just throw an extra lone pair of electrons on the chlorine in the center. And that gets me up to the 28 electrons that I added up that I needed to have. So there's the chlorine, which has an exception to the octet rule. All right, the next one, xenon trioxide. Xenon and then trioxide is O3. Xenon has eight valence electrons. It's a noble gas. Um, oxygen is 3 times 6, so we'd have 18 plus 8, and that's going to give us 26 electrons. I'm going to put the xenon in the middle. We're going to start this out like we do all of our problems. And I'm going to give everybody 8, including the xenon. And when I do this and I add them up, this is 8, 16, 24, 26. So this is not an exception to the octet rule. Everybody has eight. I put this one in there, in there though because of xenon, xenon being a noble gas. I wanted you to see that sometimes you will run across noble gases in these, and xenon is a really common one that you will see. All right, beryllium dichloride. Beryllium is Be, dichloride would be Cl2. I need to watch out right away because beryllium, I know, is one of my exceptions. B and BE are the ones I don't, well, and hydrogen. I don't ever want to give lone pairs to. So when I'm making this structure, I'm going to make sure I don't put dots around beryllium. Beryllium is in column 2A, so it only has two valence electrons, plus two times the chlorines, which each have seven, so that would be 14 plus two is 16. 
I start by putting beryllium in the middle, attach a chlorine to each side, and then I want to give everybody eight who needs it, which is not beryllium. So when I do this, I have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. And that is what I said I would need. So be really careful when you see beryllium and boron. Don't put lone pairs around them until you absolutely have to at the end. Always start like this with them just bonded to what it says in the formula. Okay. Along with Lewis structures, sometimes you have resonance structures, and a resonance is when you have more than one valid Lewis structure. So if you remember back to like the nitrate, I said you could pick anywhere, any of those nitrogen oxygens bonds in order to make a double bond. You can pick wherever you would like to go with those, it doesn't matter. They're all valid, they all mean the same thing. So resonance structures are when you show all the valid Lewis structures for a certain molecule. Um, we're going to do an example with one of these, and it'll be the nitrate ion. So the nitrate ion was the NO3 with the minus 1. And when we drew it the first time, we double bonded, I don't remember which side, but it ended up looking like this. So we had these electrons around the oxygen. And it didn't matter where we put the double bond, but we put it right there. When you're doing resonance structures, you're going to show all possible locations. So what you do is you do a double-sided arrow. I do another square bracket because this is an ion. And maybe this time, I do the double bond straight down. So here's that Lewis structure. And that's a negative one. And then I'm going to run out of room. Let's go kind of angle this way. Usually they would be in a straight line, but I'm going to run out of room here. You would do your last option with the double bond over here. So it would be O, double bond N, and then singles. And then I'd include all my lone pairs here. And this is what it looks like. So in real life, you need to understand that this double bond actually exists in all three places at the same time. Because what they find out is that a single bond is the longest bond. A double bond gets a little shorter. And then a triple bond is the shortest of the three. Because the more electrons you're sharing, the stronger the pull and the closer the atoms get. So what they find, though, is with like something with the nitrate ion, where you have the possibility of resonance, where you can put the double bond in more than one place, they actually find that the bonds for the nitrate ion fall in between a single and a double. So that tells us that the bonds actually kind of, the electrons distribute themselves equally amongst the three places and they create almost a hybrid, a single, not a single bond and not a double bond, but somewhere in the middle. So when we have these resonance structures, we're showing where the double bond could go, but in reality it's in all places at the same time. Okay, formal charge is the way that we can tell which um, molecules, Lewis structure is probably the most correct. So formal charge is assigned by you. It's something that you have to calculate. Here's the formula. It's the actual number of valence electrons and the actual means periodic table number. So that's from the periodic table minus the assigned number. And the assigned number is lone pairs around it. Lone pairs and half of the shared electrons. So for example, if it has a single bond going to it, because a single bond represents two electrons, it would be assigned one of those electrons. And maybe when I do an example, it'll be a little more clear. Um, formal charge, the best structures, what you're looking for is when the formal charges are closest to zero for all atoms, that's a good structure. And also if you have a negative formal charge, that it needs to be on the most electronegative atom. And remember, electronegativity increases diagonally up 
on the periodic table. Okay, so our example here is sulfate. If I were to draw sulfate how I would think with my normal um, Lewis structure rules, what I would come out with is something that looked like this. All the sulfurs are single bonded to the, or I mean all the oxygens are single bonded to the sulfur. And this is what it would look like. So if I'm trying to figure out formal charge, what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate it for each atom. So formal charge on my single bond O's, and they're all single bond O's. I take the number that is um, given, so the number, the actual number on oxygen, which would be 6, and I need to subtract how many it's assigned. So since each of these O's is identical, I'll just pick this one right here. It's been assigned 2, 4, 6, and it gets one of these, which would be 7. So oxygen has a formal charge of negative 1. Each of these O's has a negative 1 for a formal charge. Then I need to look at the sulfur. The sulfur is also assigned six electrons from the, or given, it actually has six electrons from the periodic table, and each sulfur is assigned one, two, three, four electrons. So six minus four is a plus two. So your sulfur right here has a positive two for a formal charge. Those numbers are not so good. Um, it doesn't really flow with what we said makes a good resonant, not a good resonance structure, a good Lewis structure in terms of formal charge. So actually what sulfate looks like is S double bonded to two O's and single bonded to two other O's. So I'm going to go ahead and throw in my lone pairs on my O's here. And you are not expected to know this. This is something they would provide you with, like the two examples here, and ask you which is the best example of what the Lewis structure of sulfate would look like. So you would use this. All right, so formal charge. If we did the formal charge, we're going to have to look at the double bond O's and the single bond O's individually. So the double bond O's, double bond O's here, would have a formal charge they actually have six from the periodic table, and we have given them two, four, five, six, and we've given them six. So they have a formal charge of zero. These double bond O's have a formal charge of zero. I should put like a little dash through that so we don't get confused. Okay, we also have single bond O's. And the single bond O's have six from the periodic table, and I've given them two, four, six, seven. So they have a formal charge of negative one. And then if I look at the sulfur, the sulfur has six from the periodic table and I'm giving it one, two, three, four, five, six. So it also has a formal charge of zero. And these are negative one and negative one. So you can tell by looking at these formal charges that this is actually a much better structure of what sulfate would look like as compared to that structure of sulfate. So formal charges are actually really useful in picking out the correct Lewis structure. Another one we can do is HCN. We could have HCN looking like this where carbon is the central atom. You could also have HCN where nitrogen is the central atom. Um, you cannot have hydrogen in the middle because it can only form one bond. But those are your two options for how this could look, and we can use formal charge to evaluate these two and pick the best one. So formal charge on the hydrogen. Hydrogen has one valence electron, and we've given it one valence electron, so it would have a formal charge of zero. The single bond carbon would have or the carbon, I don't, we don't really need that. The carbon has four valence electrons from the periodic table, and we've given it one, two, three, four. So it also has a formal charge of zero. Nitrogen 
has five valence electrons from the periodic table and we've given it one, two, three, four, five. So we can tell right away that this is a pretty good structure because all the atoms came out to zero. If we were to test this one over here, hydrogen has one off the periodic table and we've given it one, so it's still zero. Nitrogen has five from the periodic table and we've given it one, two, three, four. So it has a plus one charge and carbon has four on the periodic table and we've assigned it one, two, three, four, five. So it has a negative one. So you can see that this one, because all the atoms come out with a formal charge equal to zero, would be the better option for the Lewis structure. All right, the last one is the chlorate ion. And if we were to draw the chlorate ion, it would look like with the rules that we think we know, well, we do know, this is how we would make it look. And you'd have all your O's single bonded to your chlorine. And that would be a negative one. There's also the option though, and they would have to give you this one again because it doesn't follow the naming rules that you're used to or the drawing rules that you're used to. It would have two of your O's double bonded. And then all those electrons and there's actually still a lone pair there on the chlorine and this would also have the negative one charge. So those are your two options there. Um, if I were to look at the O in this one the O has six from the periodic table, and we've given it two, four, six, seven electrons. So this has a negative one charge. Chlorine has seven valence electrons from the periodic table, and we've given it one, two, three, four, five. So that has a positive two charge. Neither of those is very good, considering chlorine is the most electronegative, so it should have the negative formal charge, and it actually has a positive. If we look over here at the double bond O, so these two guys right here, they have six from the periodic table and we've given them two, four, five, six. So those have a lone, or not a lone, a formal charge of zero. If we look at the single bond oxygen at the bottom there, it has six and we've given it seven, so that would be a negative one. And then if you look at the chlorine, the chlorine has seven from the periodic table and we've given it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is zero. So this is actually, again, a much better option to choose because the formal charges come out much better in this structure. So you're not expected to know these. They would be something you're given and you'd have to evaluate them. Okay, the last thing we're gonna talk about is when we draw these Lewis structures, they have certain shapes and geometries and bond angles, and we need to know what those are. And all of those shapes and bond angles are because of the VSEPR theory. The VSEPR theory stands for the valence shell electron pair repulsion. That just means that electrons are going to move as far away from each other as possible, and that includes when they're bonding within a molecule. So we want to minimize those repulsions between electrons. And it all depends, when we're trying to figure out what its geometry is, how many domains are around the central atom. And by domains, domains can be bonds. So they can be single, double, or triple bonds. And domains can also be lone electron pairs. So they can be the two dots. So when I ask you to count up the electron domains around a molecule, you add up all the different bonds and all the different um, lone electron pairs just around the central atom. This is a table um, that you have in your handout. It's showing you, these are the electron domains. So this, oops, come back. These are the total electron domains. And I'm going to give you a separate handout in class that breaks it into bonded and lone electron pairs a little better. But this one is saying if you have just two domains, so like if I have X with 
two double bonds, so maybe that's carbon. This has two domains. It has one and two. So its shape has to be linear because the farthest these guys can get away from each other is 180 degrees, which puts it into a line. If you have three domains, so maybe I have X double bond O, O, and O like that, those are three domains around the central atom, one, two, and three. That would be trigonal planar. If we got rid of one of those bonded O's and instead made a lone pair, there are still three domains, but that does affect the shape. It now becomes bent. Because when we look at it, it'll look more like water. It'll look bent like this. So we'll practice these in class. We'll build them so you can actually see what they would look like, these 3D molecules. And um, we'll practice memorizing the bond angles and all of the names and things like that. But in this podcast, we're going to do just a couple examples. Um, carbon tetrahydride is methane. If I were to draw it, it would look like this, just its regular Lewis structure because it can have eight valence electrons. So two, four, six, eight. This would have four electron domains. And that's just around the carbon because that's the central atom. So one, two, three, four domains around the carbon. They're all bonded. So this is going to be a tetrahedral. That's its shape. Tetrahedral. Its bond angle is going to be 109.5 degrees. And that may seem confusing because when we draw them like this, it actually looks like a 90 degree angle, which it's not because we need to remember that molecules are 3D things. So they take up more space. They're not lying flat on the paper like we draw them. So sometimes when we draw them, we try to do a 3D drawing of them. And so you'll see dashes and wedges that kind of look like this. So if I were to draw it in 3D, that's what it would look like. It would be more of an angle like this. This hydrogen's coming at you. This hydrogen is going away from you. So four electron domains, all are bonded. It's a tetrahedral, 109.5. And if we want to talk about polarity, because there's no lone pairs on the carbon and all these terminal atoms are identical, this is nonpolar. Everything is symmetrical. It won't have a partial positive or partial negative charge. The next one is nitrogen trihydride. And going through all the steps to draw it, it's going to end up looking like this. So this one also has four electron domains around the nitrogen. Except now those four domains are split into one lone pair and three bonded electron pairs. So of the four, there's one lone pair and three are bonded. That makes this shape trigonal pyramidal. And your bond angle is actually going to be less than 109.5. The reason it's less than, and this is a really important idea to know, that lone electron pairs take up more space than bonded electrons. So when we're looking at these, if there were a hydrogen on there, it would be tetrahedral in 109.5. But since this lone pair is now there, that takes up more space and it pushes these hydrogens closer together. So it's less than 109.5. This would also be a polar molecule. And the polarity would run to the hydrogen. So we would draw, I mean to the nitrogen. So we would draw the polarity like this. It would be negative towards the nitrogen and positive towards the hydrogens. And again, if you wanted to draw in 3D, they would be more so angled down like this, the hydrogens would be. They wouldn't be sticking out at 90 degree angles like what you're thinking. So these are a little trickier. Sometimes they're hard to visualize what you're actually seeing, but um, you get used to them the more that you do them and you can kind of visualize them in your head. Water would look like this. Oops. When we do the Lewis structure, so again, four electron domains, two lone electron pairs, and two are bonded. So this comes out as bent. 
And again, it's going to be less than 109.5 because of those lone electron pairs. And you might be thinking that doesn't look bent. That looks linear for how I drew it. But it actually looks like this with the two lone pairs sitting more on the top of the O like that. So it's bent, the hydrogens are facing down like this. This again is going to be polar because it has a lone electron pairs, and it's going to be more negative towards the O, more positive towards the H. And then I'm just going to go ahead, well, I'll do this one really fast. We have chlorines, and we have six of them. So if I were to sketch it, it were to look like this, and then I would need square brackets and a negative one charge. This one around the phosphorus has six electron domains, all bonded. So this has the shape of being an octahedral. And between the chlorines is 90 degrees, and from this top chlorine to the bottom chlorine is actually 180. But to build this one, it's best to see the bond angles because there's so much going on right here. And drawing it on the paper, it's really hard to envision what this really looks like. So because all the chlorines are the same, all the terminal atoms are the same, because there are no lone pairs on the phosphorus, this is a nonpolar molecule. Everything is symmetrical. Um, all the chlorines are going to be pulling evenly on the phosphorus so you don't get a polar charge on this. Okay, so that was a lot of information in the podcast. Um, big ideas are drawing Lewis structures, and you're going to really have to work on memorizing the molecular geometries and bond angles. That's going to be something that's going to take some practice and some work. But we'll do lots of practice in class. We're going to build these so you can actually see them, um, and we'll work on memorizing the names and the bond angles that go with all the shapes.